According to all known laws of aviation, there was no way this case could fly. This is a community-supported legal education channel. Find out how you can support our mission at the links in the description below. Two apiarists have used copyright to fight over a retail product description, one accusing the other of removing copyright management information. Let's see what's going on here. This is a ruling from the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. James Fisher appeals from a judgment of the United States District Court for the Southern District of New York. The District Court granted summary judgment in favor of the defendants, Sandra Forrest and Brushy Mountain Bee Farm, we're going to call them Brushy Mountain, on Fisher's claims of copyright infringement and removal of copyright management information. The controversy underlying this litigation arose from the promotion by the forests of their own version of a honey harvesting product. The new product replaced one Fisher had invented and that the forest had sold for many years through the website and catalog of Brushy Mountain, a company the forests owned. Judge Engelmeyer concluded that Fisher was not entitled to statutory damages or attorney's fees, which was the relief he sought on his infringement claim, because the first allegedly infringing act occurred before the work was registered. The district court also concluded that Fisher failed to establish a copyright management information removal claim under the Digital Millennium Copyright Act at 17 U.S.C. 1202. It says 1201 here, but it's 1202. Uh, we agree and accordingly we affirm. So before we get into the background of the case, let's take a quick look at what copyright management information is uh, and what happens in 17 U.S.C. 1202. So this is integrity of copyright management information. No person shall knowingly and with intent to induce, enable, facilitate, or conceal infringement provide copyright management information that is false or distribute or import for distribution copyright management information that is false. No person shall, without the authority of the copyright owner, intentionally remove or alter copyright management information, or distribute or import for distribution products knowing that the copyright management information has been removed or altered. And when you do this, there are consequences. I think they are spelled out in 1203. So under section 1203, damages for a violation of 1202 are either actual damages or, if you have met the requirements for statutory damages, at least $2,500 and not more than $25,000. So that's a huge damage award simply for removing copyright attribution information. Fisher is an apiarist who developed a product known as Fisher's Be Quick in 1999. Fisher's Be Quick is a honey harvesting aid that is used to clear bees from the superstructures placed on beehives where bees store honey. Be Quick is sprayed on a fume board which is placed on the superstructures. The scent causes the bees to exit the structure, at which point the honey can be harvested. Be Quick was distinguished from the products of Fisher's competitors because it was non-toxic and did not have the offensive odor associated with other honey harvesting aids. Brushy Mountain was a mail-order business specializing in beekeeping supplies. It was owned and operated during the relevant period by Sandra and Stephen Forrest and its president Shane Gebauer. Brushy Mountain circulated a catalog of products well-known in beekeeping circles featuring pictures and product descriptions. Brushy Mountain began featuring Fisher's Bee Quick in its catalog in 2002 and described it as follows. This 100% natural, non-toxic blend of oils and herb extracts works just like Bee Go and it smells good. Fisher's Bee Quick is a safe, gentle, and pleasant way to harvest your honey. Are you tired of your spouse making you sleep in the garage after using Bee Go? Are you tired of using a hazardous product on the bees you love? Then and this product is for you. Fisher sold Be Quick on his own website, b-quick.com, starting around 2000, and he continued to do so during the years it was also available from Brushy Mountain. The description of Be Quick in Fisher's brochure, which was featured on the b-quick.com website, included the following phrases. Are you tired of your spouse making you sleep in the garage after using butyric and hydride? Are you tired of using hazardous products on the bees you love? Fisher's Bee Quick is a safe, gentle, and pleasant way to harvest your honey. A natural, non-toxic blend of oils and herbal extracts. Around 2010, Brushy Mountain claimed that Fisher's supply of Bee Quick was unreliable and decided to stop offering it in its catalog. In its place, Brushy Mountain started selling its own honey harvesting aid called Natural Honey Harvester. 
Brushy Mountain's July 2011 catalog described its new product as follows. For years, we have promoted the use of a natural product to harvest honey, but an unreliable supply of such a product has forced us to come out with our own. This 100% natural, non-toxic blend of oils and herb extracts works just like Bego and it smells good. Natural Honey Harvester is a safe, gentle, and pleasant way to harvest your honey. Are you tired of your spouse making you sleep in the garage after using Bego? Are you tired of using hazardous products on the bees you love, then this product is for you. The text remained in the catalog largely unchanged through 2014 and was featured on the Brushy Mountain website through 2011. The similarities between the two descriptions are the basis for Fisher's claims. He contends that Brushy Mountain simply replaced Fisher's Bee Quick with Natural Honey Harvester in their advertisements, and that this substitution constitutes copyright infringement and the unlawful removal of copyright management information. After Fisher initiated this action, initially as a pro se litigant, the parties engaged in extensive motion practice. The claims that were not dismissed proceeded through discovery, and eventually the defendant, Appellees, moved for summary judgment on the remaining claims. Magistrate Judge Andrew J. Peck, who was managing the pretrial activity, recommended granting the motion in its entirety in a July 2017 report and recommendation. The district court adopted that report in full in a February 2018 order and opinion. The district court held that Section 412 of the Copyright Act barred the recovery of statutory damages for copyright infringement because the alleged infringement predated the copyright registration. And by the way, that's before we got the Romini Street v. Oracle and Fourth Estate uh, cases that said that you have to register your copyrights before you sue. So this was, this was the same rule, but even before that. Because the infringement occurred before the registration, you don't get statutory damages. And then Fourth Estate added that you have to have the registration before you even file the lawsuit. The district court also held that Fisher failed to establish a violation of the DMCA because the changes that Brushy Mountain had made to its catalog did not constitute removal of copyright management information. This appeal followed. We review grants of summary judgment de novo, which means brand new, resolving all ambiguities and drawing all factual inferences in favor of the party against whom summary judgment is sought. So any ambiguity or, or interpretation is going to be against the person who moved for summary judgment. A court shall grant summary judgment if the movement shows that there is no genuine dispute as to any material fact and that the movement is entitled to judgment as a matter of law. So you have to show the facts, also play through the law, and operate in a way that means you're, you deserve a judgment. The Copyright Office registered Fisher's copyright for the b-quick.com website, which includes the Be Quick brochure on February 7th, 2011. We assume Fisher's website and the text contained in it are copyrightable creative works and the registration for the website is valid. As noted, Fisher has elected to pursue statutory damages. A copyright infringer can be held liable for either actual damages and profits obtained or for statutory damages. However, Section 412 precludes statutory damages or attorney's fees for any infringement of copyright in an unpublished work commenced before the effective date of its registration, or any infringement of a copyright commenced after first publication of a work and before the effective date of its registration. The defendants, appellees, argue that 412 bars statutory damages because the first allegedly infringing act occurred prior to February 7th, 2011, the registration date of the copyright. Fisher, on the other hand, argues that Section 412 does not apply because there were no pre-registration infringements by the defendants' appellees. There are a host of problems with this contention. First, Fisher's pleadings repeatedly referred to the pre-registration use of the advertising text in the Brushy Mountain catalog as infringements. For example, in the Third Amendment complaint, which is the operative complaint here, Fisher alleged that permission to use plaintiff's intellectual property in any way had been revoked, as no permission was granted to use plaintiff's copyrighted works in any way except specifically in the sales of Be Quick. Fisher also alleged that the defendant's appellees no longer had any of plaintiff's product to sell as of March 2010, and consequently, at that point, their use of the advertising text constituted infringement. 
Fisher repeated this allegation of infringement with respect to a December 10th, 2010 email from Brushy Mountain informing him that it would be discontinuing Be Quick. Fisher alleged that at that point, defendants immediately lost any right, license, or permission to use any of plaintiff's intellectual property. Moreover, the allegedly infringing advertisement for Natural Honey Harvester was in the Brushy Mountain catalog mailed on January 21st, 2011, and the allegedly infringing use of the Be Quick advertising text was on the Brushy Mountain website as early as December 26, 2010. Faced with these obstacles to statutory damages, Fisher's position shifted. He now argues that the defendant's Appellee's actions prior to his registration of the copyright are not infringements because they did have a license to use his advertising material. Although Fisher posits the existence of a license, he has failed to adduce admissible evidence of its existence, much less evidence as to its scope, terms, or dates of its creation or revocation. In addition to being inconsistent with Fisher's pleadings, this argument was raised for the first time in his objections to the magistrate judge's July 2017 report. Judge Engelmeyer correctly declined to allow Fisher to make an about-face in those objections to advance a theory of liability that contradicted his own pleadings and had not been raised during summary judgment proceedings before the magistrate judge. We see no abuse of discretion. Even were we to consider Fisher's new theory of liability at this late date, it would not save his claim for statutory damages. Fisher first contends that the defendant Appelese had a license to use Fisher's material and that the date on which the license was rescinded presents an unresolved factual issue. As noted, he has not adduced evidence sufficient to create a genuine issue of material fact as to the existence of any such license. Fisher's other contention is that a factual issue exists as to when the first allegedly infringing act occurred. In support of this contention, Fisher claims that the date the first customers received Brushy Mountain's January 2011 catalog, the first catalog to offer Natural Honey Harvester with the allegedly infringing text, must be assumed to post-date his February 7th, 2011 copyright registration. He fails to offer anything but speculation in support of this argument. For example, he points this court to an order form that specified a January 21, 2011 shipping date, the authenticity of which Fisher does not contest. That date is consistent with unrefuted testimony below that established the catalogs containing the allegedly infringing material were mailed on January 21st, 2011, well before the decisive registration date. Confronted with these facts, Fisher was obligated to come forth with admissible evidence creating a genuine issue of material fact as to the date of mailing. Fisher failed to do so. He points to a reference on the order form that indicated that the catalogs were initially marked for shipment on January 24, 2011, and argues that a 14-day shipment window would result in customers' receipt of the catalog after the February 7th registration. This reference does nothing to help Fisher. The document simply says that the catalogs were planned to be shipped on January 24th, but were, in fact, shipped on January 21st. Speculations such as these are not an appropriate substitute for admissible evidence. As we have noted, mere conclusory allegations, speculation, or conjecture will not avail a party resisting summary judgment. For these reasons, we must conclude that the first allegedly infringing act occurred before the date of the copyright registration, and no genuine issue of material fact exists concerning this issue. Consequently, Section 412 bars Fisher's recovery of statutory damages. In fact, Fisher cites no authority for the proposition that the relevant date for the first alleged act of infringement is the date of receipt of the catalog by the customers. The relevant statute states that the offering to distribute copies or phono records to a group of persons for purposes of further distribution, public performance, or public display constitutes publication. Even on Fisher's account, the catalogs were printed and shipped prior to his registration of the copyright. Fisher argues that, even if this court finds that statutory damages are precluded pursuant to Section 412, this court should still afford him declaratory relief. Fisher bases his claim on the defendant Appellee's stipulation at oral argument on the summary judgment motion that they would, one, remove any links and photos containing Fisher's name or product on Brushy Mountain's website, and that they would not use the four advertising phrases again in the future. At the time, Fisher agreed that this booted his request for injunctive relief. However, on appeal, Fisher claims that the defendant Appellee's stipulation is functionally a consent decree and that the court should grant declaratory judgment on the basis of the stipulation. 
he offers no support for this contention. Moreover, Fisher did not seek declaratory relief below. The stipulation did not concede that the text at issue was Fisher's copyrighted work, nor did it concede that the defendant, Appelee's, use of the text was an infringement. Fisher next argues that the defendants, Appelee's, violated the DMCA when they removed Fisher's Be Quick from the advertising copy on the Brushy Mountain website. The DMCA was passed in 1998 to implement two international treaties resulting from the 1996 World Intellectual Property Organization Convention. Congress's intent in enacting the DMCA was to update the copyright laws of the United States for the digital age. Generally speaking, the two major aims of the DMCA are, one, anti-circumvention of access controls, and two, creating a safe harbor for service providers when their users or other third parties engage in infringing activities, as codified in Section 1201 for access controls and Section 512 for the safe harbor. At its passage, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act contemplated a new world, untested in prior court decisions. This appeal focuses on the anti-circumvention component of the DMCA, and specifically on the definition of copyright management information in Section 1202C. Section 1202 was required by both WIPO treaties to ensure the integrity of the electronic marketplace by preventing fraud and misinformation. Section 1202 realizes this aim by prohibiting intentionally providing false copyright management information with the intent to induce, enable, facilitate, or conceal infringement. It also prohibits the deliberate deleting or altering of copyright management information. This section is intended to protect consumers from misinformation as well as authors and copyright owners from interference with the private licensing process. While the DMCA establishes certain protections for copyright holders in a digital medium, it also establishes limitations on copyright liability in the interest of promoting growth, development, and innovation in the digital universe. In broad strokes, 1202C protects the integrity of copyright management information and prohibits the removal of CMI from copyrighted works. This statute describes CMI as information such as the author, title, and other identifying data about the copyright holder of the work. In relevant part, the term copyright management information is defined as any of the following information conveyed in connection with copies of a work or displays of a work, including in digital form, except that such term does not include any personally identifying information about a user of a work or of a copy or display of a work. One, the title and other information identifying the work, including the information set forth on the notice of copyright. Two, the name of or other identifying information about the author of a work. Three, the name of the copyright owner of the work, including the information set forth on the notice of copyright. 6. Terms and conditions for use of the work. 7. Identifying numbers or symbols referring to such information or links to such information. And 8. Such other information as the Register of Copyrights may prescribe by regulation, except that the Register of Copyrights may not require the provision of any information concerning the user of a copyrighted work. To establish a violation of this subsection, a litigant must show, one, the existence of copyright management information on the allegedly infringing work, two, the removal or alteration of that information, and three, that the removal was intentional. Fisher alleges that his name is CMI, and that by deleting the phrase, Fisher's Be Quick, and replacing it with Natural Honey Harvester, the defendant's appellees violated section 1202C by removing his name from copyrighted material. This assertion misunderstands what constitutes CMI. While an author's name can constitute CMI, not every mention of the name does. Here, Fisher's is part of a product name. It is not a reference to James H. Fisher as the owner of a copyrighted text, nor is the name, the title, and other information identifying the work, or the name of and other identifying information about the author of the work as required by the statute. We grant that Natural Honey Harvester was designed as a closely resembling alternative to Fisher's Be Quick, and that the advertising copy used on Brushy Mountain's website and catalog for Natural Honey Harvester mirrors the advertising copy that had been used for Fisher's Be Quick. However, what was removed was not Fisher's name as the copyright holder of the advertising text, but Fisher's insofar as it was part of the actual product's name. Judge Engelmeyer provided an example to illustrate the problem with Fisher's approach. Imagine that the back cover of the Ian Fleming novel Dr. No contained the following encomium. Oh my goodness, okay, we are learning new words already here. Uh, so the previous judge used this word encomium. I have never, ever heard that word in my entire life. 
Encomium means a speech or piece of writing that praises someone or something highly. Okay. Encomium. I learned something new today. I hope you did too. Imagine that the back cover of the Ian Fleming novel Dr. No contained the following encomium. In Ian Fleming's Dr. No, Fleming shows his mastery of Cold War spycraft. Imagine then that a person lifted language from that review to promote a different thriller, writing, In John Le Carre's Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, Le Carre shows his mastery of Cold War spycraft. Whatever the other legal implications of such conduct might be, it is inconceivable that a DMCA claim would lie from the elimination of Fleming's name. The expression at issue does not connote Fleming's copyright ownership of anything. Similarly, Fisher's Be Quick, used in material published by a third party like Brushy Mountain, which contains advertisements for dozens of other products from many different suppliers, cannot reasonably be construed as an identifier of the copyright holder of the advertising text. In other words, Fisher's, in Fisher's Be Quick, is not used for managing copyright information with respect to the text at issue. The name of an author can, of course, constitute CMI when conveyed in connection with the relevant copyrighted work, but Fisher's cannot be construed as CMI with respect to the advertising text at issue here, because it is simply the name of the product being described. In short, context matters. We have considered Fisher's remaining arguments and conclude that they are without merit. The judgment of the district court is affirmed. And that is Fisher versus Brushy Mountain Bee Farm. That's our show. Thanks for joining me. I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney, and this is Lawful Masses, your favorite legal news and education channel here on YouTube, Flowplane, and Twitch. This is a community-supported channel. Thank you very much for your monthly support on Patreon, on Sponsus. In the month of August, thank you to the following $50 plus supporters. Nicely Done Defense, Wes Telge, Citizen of the Sovereign, John Steele, Gavin Bernard, Evie, Kyle Mudrock, Spirit Bear, Jan Gray, Benjamin Hytoff, Steven, Blackleaf, Cute Grills in Your Area, Long Reach Jones, Definitely Not Prenda Law, Ugly Grill, Shiloh T, Rudolph Besherer Jr., Oscar the Prophet, Jay Dixon, Hot Grills in Your Area, Ammonite, NG, Brandon Abel, Torpedon, and Creative Corruptions. And thank you to the $5 plus supporters who are scrolling on the uh, LED simulator panel behind me. And everybody will be in the description of the videos that drop. I'll see you in the videos. I love you all. Bye.